Part 4 of the CubeSat video, we take a look at the solar system. And if you didn't already know this, the sun produces about a thousand watts of electricity per square meter. And in space, that number goes, we don't have the atmosphere or the gases and stuff that's filtering a lot of the available power out. So it actually ends up being about 1,350 watts per square meter. Now, that's not the entire story, um, but in today's video, we actually look at how to size the solar panels for a potential CubeSat project. So let's get at it. To quickly recap as to what we've done in this series, if you're new to the channel and this is the first time you're watching one of these videos, in the first part of this video, we actually looked at the CubeSat and the CubeSat cost as to what could possibly cost so much. And we've identified that actually was the label was the biggest portion. The second video, we looked at the antenna systems and what sort of materials would actually make for a proper antenna for CubeSat and why they often use tape measures. And in the third video, we looked at burn resistors as to how they get these antennas deployed after they've been released from the launch vehicle. And in today's video, we'll actually look at the solar panels, the arrangement on the solar panels, and how to size the solar panels for a potential CubeSat project. And so if we take a quick look at our little CAD model of our PicoSat, you can see where the solar panels are actually located on the device. And all we need to look at is the amount of area that is covered by solar panels on our little CubeSat. So sitting at around 4,712 square millimeters of available space. And what we need to do is take that number and work out what our available power is for our little CubeSat per side. And we'll get to that a bit more. So looking at a few slides here, um, step one is to determine the little available surface area exposed to the sun at any given point for our CubeSat. Now, that sounds easy enough, but what you need to understand is when you look at a CubeSat, the reason why, well, one of the reasons why a CubeSat is square is at any given point, if you shine a light on a CubeSat, there is three areas that is exposed and all three of those areas can be covered with solar panels if you do not have some sort of attitude control system employed in your CubeSat. For our little CubeSat and the design we have right now, which will discuss the potential mission as well as the size and the form factor of our little CubeSat in the next video, it's just important to note that we have solar panels on the front of our device, as you can see here, as well as at a 30 degree angle on all sides and on both sides. So it doesn't matter if the sun hits us from the top, we have two sides there as well as depending on which side the device is actually tilted towards. So looking at the calculation here, it comes to 4,712 cubic centimeters. And if we look at the next step from research, we know that outside of our atmosphere, we're sitting at about 1,350 watts of available power um, per square meter. Now convert that to square centimeters and you're sitting at 0 0.135. Now, the fact is that our little CubeSat, when we convert that millimeter squared to centimeters, we're sitting at about 47 centimeters per side. And the reason why that is important is because of the tumble or the potential tumble rate of this device. I did a quick demonstration as to how this could possibly work. To do a demonstration as to what is meant by the tumbling effect, you have to understand that when a satellite gets released into orbit, there is no friction or anything to act against. So if your CubeSat for some reason actually gets exposed to any sort of force that causes a rotational momentum in your device, it would actually end up tumbling forever. And something like that could be any sort of rate. So when you look at this sort of thing, you can understand why we say that a CubeSat has two sides. And when you start understanding that a CubeSat can tumble in space, and I'm just showing it in one uh, axis rotating here, but in reality, this could actually be rotating in, in any axis. And there is no way that you can be able to get all of your solar panels facing the sun at the same time without some sort of attitude adjustment mechanism. So for smaller type of satellites like CubeSats, the general go-to is just to cover as much surfaces as you can with solar panels. So it doesn't matter in which orientation you are, you get a decent amount of um, solar power. That's why you can only work at one time or 
the calculations for one side of your CubeSat at any given point because that's the maximum amount of power that will be exposed to the sun at any given point. When you suspect your CubeSat is actually going to be tumbling, there are some clever ways in circuitry to make sure that you can still harvest the amount of energy required even although your device is tumbling at some given rate through space around Earth. If we take that available amount of watts per square centimeter and we multiply it by our CubeSat side, we get to 6.36 watts. Now, that's a lot, right? Um, well, it is, but it isn't. And there's a issue here. So, Looking at the slide here to make it a bit easier for explanation, size A is exactly the same size as our little cube set. I just drew it out on a two-dimensional plane to, to illustrate the point. You see, the problem is even with today's solar panels, they are only 20% efficient for the, on the lower end and maybe 30% on, on the higher end. Now that's bad and you can spend a bit more and some companies claim that they have a lot more efficient solar panels and they are getting better at it. But the sort of solar panels that we are dealing with on this type of CubeSat, low cost entry stuff, it's safe to work with like a 20% number. And if you then actually take what our effective area is of our total area, that means that if we have that little solar panel that was covering 952 square millimeters, but was 100% efficient, it would generate the same amount of power that the big solar panel would at 20%. So that's the issue with solar panel efficiency and if we then relate that back to our number we'll see that from a total available power we have we actually only have 1.26 watts of effective generating per side so it does reduce the number quite a bit to make things a bit more complicated we have something called the exposure time and the lap time for cubesats now if the cubesat is actually deployed in low earth orbit it will roughly do about 14 to 16 orbits per day and it'll take about 60 to 90 minutes to complete a orbit. Obviously you have to understand that half of that time is spent on the dark side or in the shadow of Earth and the other side in, in sunlight so you can't count all the time just as um, available time for, for charging your batteries. So if we do a quick calculation down here and we say that we take the average numbers of what is available, 75, we divide it by two to account for daylight and, and nighttime or shadow and, and we multiply it by an average of 15 orbits. So what you see we get is, is 9.3 hours at 1.6 at 1.26 watts um, available power per day. Now, is that enough? Well, yes and no. You see, for our little mission that doesn't have an inherent application, just sending a message to illustrate the purpose or the, the capability of doing so, that should be more than enough. And we'll get more into that once we actually kept design the circuitry around the device. But let's for argument's sake take, take Starlink missions or global communication systems or any of these systems, they require to communicate at a high rate of speed. Therefore, you can see how this number would have to be increased by quite a lot to always sustain the amount of availability and transmissions and receptions from Earth. Just from looking at the numbers, I know that 1.265 watts per hour for 9.3 hours a day is going to be more than enough for what we need because our average transmission only uses about 60 to 80 milliamps and each transmission is less than a second. So you can work out for yourself how much transmissions that is before we actually run out of power. And we have the added advantage of when we simply get too low on battery, we can switch the device off and go from there. Now, it's easier said than done because as we had discussed, when you have the tumble rate of this device, that 1.26 watts is actually divided by two and you need to effectively be able to generate power from a device that is at a duty cycle switching and receiving power from both ends simultaneously. So it's a bit more complicated to do, but that's really where the energy harvesting um, ICs comes in and how they work differently from traditional solar charging systems. I hope you found this video informative and if you've seen anything wrong, please drop a comment below. I'm happy to hear from you. I'm just a guy in a basement working this stuff out for myself and sharing it to you or sharing it with you so you can learn alongside with me. Until next time, cheers.